Jeffrey Thomas. It's already been mentioned that he's the uh, aviation editor for the West Australian newspaper. He's publisher and executive editor for uh, Airline Review International. He's also the airline's editor for Australian Aviation. He wears many other hats. He's on the move all the time. He's produced a number of books which are very uh, interesting to read. Uh, the pictures are great. The uh, technical detail is put in very reasonable terms so that the average person can understand it. And um, they're up to date. And so uh, I'd recommend you to uh, have a look at any of these books. He's ably assisted by Christine Forbes-Smith, uh, who's a writer and editor in her own right. And uh, it shows through. There's a feminine touch there as well. So, Geoffrey, over to you. What's happening at Perth Airport? Nothing to do with the rail. We're, we're done with that. <laughs> I think uh, negotiating with Perth Airport is a little bit like negotiating with your mother-in-law. Um, <laughs> uh, my, my talk today is about Perth Airport. Will it ever be ready for the growth that we are experiencing and have been experiencing for the last 53 years? Now, don't be alarmed. That's not Perth Airport's new low-cost terminal. Uh, that's a gorgeous picture taken by Betty Foster, who was that Robinson Miller Airlines air hostess in the late 50s, early 60s, who took some gorgeous photographs of Western Australia in colour, um, and it's a, a magnificent record. But uh, we, we've got a major problem at Perth Airport. It's, a, it's an extraordinary problem. Um, and I hope to highlight some of the issues today. Um, and so we're going to start off um, back in the 1960s, when I was in pyjamas and dressing gown, and I got my first interest in aviation. My, Late, late uncle was the chief engineer for Trans Australian Airlines and he used to take me to Perth Airport to clamber over DC-6Bs and Viscounts while he did engine changes on them. So in 1960, at Perth Airport, there was 126,000 domestic passengers, 7,500 international passengers, total 134,000, and we had 7,000 movements per year. And that's what Perth Airport looked like. That's uh, the old terminal, the old, old terminal, um, and you can see a couple of comets there, uh, Viscount DC-6B and the South African Airways DC-7B over there. That's Perth Airport um, after the new terminal was, well, the terminal was built for the uh, Empire Games. A DC-3 over there and a Bristol Britannia over there, Eagle Airways, and the Lancaster is sitting there, as some of you will remember. And these are some of the shots. Um, we had introdu introduction of jets in 1964, um, change travel dramatically. And then we have the South African Airways uh, aeroplane, the Viscount. And these are a couple of shots of the terminal. Um, and today, that area right there is the baggage collection carousels for Qantas. Uh, and then through there is the Virgin Terminal. Um, uh, and that's, of course, brings back memories for many of us. By 1970, um, the total number of passengers had jumped by 300%. The, the era of jets had brought the cost of travel down dramatically. Uh, aircraft movements were up 82%. Things were really on the move. And this was the face of Perth Airport in 1970. Um, the two airline policy was in full swing. Uh, two jets at midday, two jets at midnight. Uh, we all remember that and all you got was sandwiches and, and be happy. Um, and MMA kept taking lovely photographs of their aeroplanes all lined up. Um, this, this was the face of the mining boom, um, Sursa 1970, where in fact I worked for the Robinson Miller Airlines. And these are the planes that used to fly to Port Hedland, Tom Price, Newman, Carapa, etc. Um, we move on to 1980. And air travel has grown in that 10 years by 100%, up to 1.2 million passengers. Aircraft movements have jumped another 70% over that period of time. And this is the face of Perth Airport. And this is a Friday morning. In fact, when we used to have 747s all come in overnight and depart, um, and it made for some quite spectacular photography for those interested, like Neville and myself. Um, <laughs> And on Friday morning, we had five 747s, Air India, Garuda, Air New Zealand, Singapore Airlines, and that one there is Qantas. 
1990, air travel is still booming, up 83%. Um, aircraft movements, up 50%. And this was the face. We had the new international terminal, which came into operation in the late 1980s. Um, and on the domestic side, the tail lineup, the Lancet, and Qantas Beyond, uh, Perth Airport was really getting quite busy. By 2000, we're up another 81% over the prior 10 years. We're up to 5 million passengers going through Perth Airport. Aircraft movements, up 120%. And one of the dynamics there is that fly-in, fly-out started during the 1990s and started getting to full swing. So a lot more smaller aircraft, small jets going to mine sites. This was the face of Perth Airport then. Uh, we actually chartered a helicopter and went for a fly um, to get a bit of a, a, a sense of how busy it was. Um, you can just see a little bit of a car park and it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting to contrast that with some slides that come up in a minute. Uh, we're getting 747s on the domestic route uh, to handle demand. Um, by 2010, we're up to 120% growth in that 10 years from 2000 to 2010. Despite SARS, despite a Gulf War, despite uh, the global financial crisis, we still grew 120%. Passengers up to 10.5 million. This was the face of Perth Airport in 2010. As you can see, tremendous amount of activity. 2013, in the last three years, we've grown another 30%, 10% a year. Some months, one month last year, we grew 17% in a month. That was in October last year. Aircraft movements up another 28%, that's basically 8% uh, a year, up to 154,000. 13.9 million passengers. In actual fact, it's actually a million more than that because Perth Airport's statistics do not include FIFO from the terminals operated by Network, Skippers, Marumba, and Cobham. They are excluded from Perth Airport's figures. So the actual figure is a million more uh, in, that, in that, uh, that number there. Midweek from 5.30 a.m. in the morning till 7.30, there are about 80 departures, 10 arrivals. There are 30 aircraft tows, which means you've got to tow aeroplanes across runways, and that basically almost equates to one movement because of the dysfunctionality of the airport. So let's have a look around Perth Airport, and this, these series of photographs were taken just two months ago. Um, <coughs> sorry, three months ago, um, late 2012, and you get a sense of the scale of the domestic side of Perth Airport today. And this was, these were taken just before the opening of the new domestic uh, uh, regional, sorry, the new regional terminal on the international side. That gives you a scale of how busy it is first thing in the morning. These were taken about five o'clock, just before the flight started out for the day. Um, there's planes everywhere. There's about 160 aeroplanes overnight at Perth, which is actually the most number of anywhere in Australia. Also during the early hours of the morning, uh, unbeknown to most of us, 45 tonnes, tonnes of express cargo, that's just those lovely little yellow bags you get dumped on your doorstep the first thing in the morning, 45 tonnes comes in between before 4am, 50% of it is for transshipment to the northwest for uh, spare parts, etc. Three 737s arrive, they're all pure freighters. Um, that's why it's extremely <coughs> important at Perth that we don't have the curfew, uh, because of the amount of activity that happens early in the morning. And that activity, of course, at Perth Airport translates into log jams of aeroplanes. Uh, these are some of the pictures that I've taken. Um, this is the one that we featured in the West uh, in November last year. A lineup. I was actually going to Sydney in November last year and we waited 45 minutes queuing to take off and then when we turned to take off I was delighted to see another 14 aeroplanes behind us um, <laughs> much to the horror of Perth Airport and snapped these photographs um, and it makes a very compelling picture of the, of the demand uh, at Perth Airport. So what does the growth look like from an air traffic controller point of view? Um, I don't know how many of you have been in to look at the radar screens of an air traffic controller but this, I shot, I shot these using a, a program by Sabre Solutions, which tracks all aeroplanes. And this is 5.15 a.m. 
This was last year, April 27th. This is five, and the, each of these little um, note, the tags here gives you an aircraft um, flight number, it gives you altitude, it gives you uh, origin, destination, it gives you speed and altitude. That's 5.15, that's 5.30, 5.45, 6 o'clock, 6.15, 6.30, 6.45, 7 o'clock, 7.30, 7.45. And half an hour later, it all comes back the same way. Because they get to the mine sites, they turn around come back. And that happens all day long. It's, uh, it's extraordinary. So we have the great growth debate, which I like to call. Perth Airport's view, we actually put uh, the, the Troy Buswell, has commissioned state aviation review, which will bring its findings out very shortly. And they predicted extraordinary growth for Perth over the next 15, 20 years. I put those figures to Perth Airport, and their view was this. The past is not a good indicator of the future. <laughs> <laughs> which is contrary to Winston Churchill, who said, the further you look back, the further you can see forward. Um, Perth also said, that our travel per capita is well above that of other Australian capitals. As a result, it's reasonable to expect that the growth rate for outbound residents will slow materially. In other words, we've done all the travel we want to and we don't want to travel anymore. That's their view. <laughs> Perth Airport also believes that Western Australia will not materially outperform the rest of the country in tourism in the long term. So they have a negative view on our ability to attract international visitors. Those are the sorts of statements that govern their thinking, in my view. The great blame game. Perth Airport, when questioned as to why they didn't foresee the growth at Perth Airport, said to us, the government, the resource sector, including the Chamber of Minerals and Energy, all dramatically underestimated the growth, and it should come as no surprise, therefore, that Perth Airport underestimated the demand as well. This was in reference to their master plan in 2009. And to be fair to Perth Airport, that master plan was drawn up at the depths of the global financial crisis. Except, at the depths of the financial crisis, Perth Airport's growth was actually 6% for that particular year. So it became very clear to anybody who stuck their head out of a window who worked at Perth Airport that, hey, just guess what? The global financial crisis is passing us by. It will have no effect on us whatsoever, and it's business as usual. They chose to ignore that. After that response, the Chamber of Minerals Energy contacted us and came to see us and said, we in actual fact predicted um, this growth potential continuing late in 2009, and indeed they did. You go to their reports, uh, in fact, the early 15th of January 2010, you can see the words, the frenetic progress of the last 12 months has seen departure of uncertainty and economic turbulence fostered by the global financial crisis and the return to heightened levels of industry activity, development, expectations, experience in front of the global downturn. In other words, it's business as usual in Western Australia. Perth Airport chose to ignore that. Perth Airport also said that, as I said earlier, no one predicted it. Well, we did. This is our article in December of 2009 with uh, Don Randall. Uh, Don Randall, in actual fact, was ridiculed by Perth Airport as saying he didn't know what he was talking about. In actual fact, he predicted perfectly what was going to happen, as did we, because we simply looked up Perth Airport statistics and looked at the numbers and said, something is extraordinary is happening here. So, Perth Airport continued this blame game. This is a letter to the editor uh, of the West Australian six, uh, about uh, 18 months ago. Uh, this is unique demand. And Perth Airport has not constrained airline growth. Well, in actual fact, they have, because you cannot get a, a takeoff slot at Perth Airport between 5 or 30 in the morning and 7.30 in the morning uh, on weekdays. It's simply not available. You cannot get a landing, a landing or takeoff slot. They also said constructing a third runway now would do little to assist. That particular comment is, is as ludicrous as you can possibly get because, uh, and in fact, after that letter, a whole lot of pilots wrote to the west and, and ridiculed Perth Airport over it. Because as we all know, a parallel runway doubles the number of aeroplane movements that you can handle. So clearly from these sorts of statements, um, 
they seem to be very negative on building another runway at Perth Airport. Um, now this is a very interesting uh, graph that we've constructed. The first line of it. It'll, okay, here we go. This is a line which is a Boeing and Airbus industry line. And that is the average growth in the world, 5% since 1980. Air travel has grown on the average 5% every single year. There's been some dips every now and again. <coughs> Perth Airport's master plan of 2004 predicts growth below the world average. And we are the engine of Australia's economy. We are the most robust economy in the world, except for the Chinese, yet it predicts that we will grow below the world average, which is mind-boggling. Then, in 2009, the depths of the GFC, and I acknowledge it was the depths of the GFC, they predicted no growth whatsoever, peaking about 2012, 6%, and then slumping all the way back to 2%, to 2029. That's what they predicted. That's the actual growth of Perth Airport. <laughs> it is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and that tells a very compelling story. During the GFC, as I said, 2009, passenger numbers rose by 6%, aircraft numbers rose by 7.29%. Fact one, Perth Airport's traffic growth has grown by 9.1% a year since 1960, <coughs> almost 12, twice the world average. But why? Okay. Cheaper travel. 1960, 35 weeks salary to go to London. 2013, one week salary will get you to London. Isolation. We have the most, apart from, apart from Honolulu, we have the most isolated capital in the world. Um, the resource industry, of course. The resource industry had a tremendous impact. And it's going to have a tremendous impact. I was talking to one of the chief executives today, one of the largest fly-in, fly-out operations, a very, very good friend of mine, and I said to him, I'm about to give a speech this afternoon, I just want to recheck, how's business? He said, business is fantastic. He said, it's not frantic, as it was 12 months ago, but it's very considered, very positive, and there's lots and lots more work in the, in the uh, pipeline, and we're buying more aeroplanes. So, the other thing is the X factor. And this is a fascinating, fascinating story. What is the X factor? Well, it turns out that 20% of humans have a variant of the gene called DR, DR, D4. The variant is called 7R, which prompts the urge to travel. <laughs> I should imagine all of you being flyers or people who love flying, you've probably all got it. You look like you've got it as well. 40% of all residents in WA were born overseas. 40% of the people in WA were born overseas. So they had the urge to come to WA, to get the Eastern Staters, like myself, I'm from Sydney. They were 40% born in WA. Add to that 20% of the residents of WA that weren't born, that were born here, one of their parents was born overseas as well. So according to UWA, it can be concluded that over 50% of the residents of WA have the wonderlust, <laughs> desire to travel. And that's an, that's an imponderable that has never been taken into consideration. We wonder why. My PA, uh, the girl who works for me, she went to Bali last year five times. Mm -hmm. Any excuse to go to Bali? Wedding, friends get together, weekend, whatever you like, just go to Bali. Go here, go there, go everywhere. And it's so cheap. It's, and it's in our genes, that's it, it's in our genes. Now, Perth Airport would have you believe that um, the problem of the runway capacity of Perth Airport will, will be solved by larger aeroplanes. And to a very, very small extent, that's right, Emirates later on this year will introduce the A380. That will help. However, the international trend is completely the opposite to that. Perth Airport, 985, that's the shot I showed you. All 747s on a Friday. These airlines, one flight a week, one flight a week, one flight a week, one flight a week, 747 on a Friday. 995, we're down to DC-10s and a couple of 747s, smaller capacity. 2005, what have we got? We've got 777s, 
767s, A330s, twin engine aeroplanes, 300 seaters, far more economical um, and able to give you daily services. That's where it goes today. Like Emirates, three, three services a day. Singapore Airlines, four services a day. They, they don't run larger aeroplanes, they run more frequencies. This is a Boeing graph, a uh, really interesting graph. That's air travel off, off a base of one air travel growth up to 2010. That's the increase in frequencies. That's the increase in non-stops. People want to fly <coughs> non-stops, like politicians. They want to go Perth Canberra, not Perth Sydney Canberra, not Perth Melbourne Canberra, but Perth Canberra. And prior to the demise of ANSA, if you wanted to go to Brisbane, you had to go via Sydney or Adelaide or Melbourne, because there was no flight from Perth to Brisbane. Now Qantas has what, four flights a day? Virgin has three flights a day, non-stops. It's all about non-stops. That's the size of the aeroplanes, like that. So the, the, one of the interesting things is the 747, the airlines bought 747s for one reason, it had the range. You needed four engines to have the range through till 1990. Um, and into the 1990s when you had aeroplanes like the 777, with two engines, and the 777 today is actually the longest range aeroplane in the world. It's far longer range than an A380 or a 747. And when those sorts of aeroplanes, 300 seaters, became capable with the range, they now dominate the Pacific, <coughs> they now dominate the Atlantic. And in actual fact, across the Atlantic in 19, 1980, I think it was, 747s were about 97% of flights across the North Atlantic. Today, they are about 1 or 2% of flights across the North Atlantic. Most of them are done by 300 passenger twin engine aeroplanes. Now, in Western Australia, and this is an interesting graph, this is um, the non stops uh, between Japan and China. Eight city pairs, 59 weekly frequencies. This was in 1990. 2008, 696 weekly frequencies, 57 city pairs connected. And of course, the beauty with non stops, it also makes travel, travel cheaper because you haven't got that extra stop, extra fuel, extra costs, etc. <coughs> so will air airlines go for larger aircraft in Perth? Well, the answer is no. Network Aviation just bought 10 new Fokker 100s. Skywest has two more 180 seat A320s coming. Skippers has two Fokker 100s due any day. Virgin and his Qantas are building large fleets around the 180, 737, 125, 717. And there's a very good reason for this. It's a very, very, very good reason for this. Most regional and remote airports can't handle larger aircraft. Very simple problem. Only about 12 airports in WA are 737 or A320 capable. That's the 180 seaters. The cost to upgrade the 80 other airports that are used for FIFO would cost tens of billions of dollars. And uh, there's only a few FIFO airports. I think there's about five of them altogether that can handle an A320 aeroplane. And one of the reasons is, that's one of them, um, that's, I think that's West Angeles from memory. One of the reasons is the mining companies, when they put these airports in, they said, well, this is a good place for an airport, we'll whack it in here. But if you extend it, there's these mountains at the other end. And in fact, many of these runways would have to be completely turned around or recited. Uh, not, not, to, not just a matter of extending them a little bit, uh, it's a matter of completely relocating them. And that's the, that's the other end of that runway, there's a mountain at the other end. At current growth rate, rate um, Perth Airport will be at total full capacity by 2017, as far as its runway is concerned. The cost, 20% of scheduled flights through Perth are delayed by 30 minutes. Uh, no figure on the FIFO flights, that's only scheduled flights. The fuel waste is $24 million a year. Uh, the direct cost to the state is now $72 million a year, that's the direct. And this is the real killer. Cost to industry, a one hour delay on a FIFO flight cost $100,000 in lost production. These numbers are staggering. Fact two and three. A single daily international 747 service, and we're talking about limiting the growth of the state, contributes $120 million a year to the economy and creates 1,500 full-time jobs. An A380 service from, say, China, from, say, Guangzhou, China Southern, they would bring one in, 388 million a year for the economy and 5,000 full-time jobs. That's the earning capacity of these sorts of aeroplanes. And this is where we're going now 
into an area where we are going to be restricting airlines' ability to operate into Perth because of the runway capacity. The cost of another runway, Perth Airport originally said it would cost 900 million, and we at the West said, well, that's, that's not, that's ridiculous. They came back and said, well, it's going to cost 580 million instead. It'll take four years. FMG builds two 737 capable runways in 16 weeks for 50 million each in the last year. <laughs> and so one wonders why do we need a $580 million Rolls Royce runway when maybe we should just get FMG to build one for us. <laughs> so what is happening? It's not all bad news at Perth Airport. There's, good, there's, there's really good stuff happening. The new T2 regional terminal is open. We're getting expansion of Terminal 1, it's the international terminal. Uh, the new version of Australia Pier opens in June 2014, and there's a billion dollars worth of freeway and bridge works under construction as of this month, which will take four years to complete. That'll reshape the entire infrastructure around the airport. That's T1. That's it from the control tower. That's new uh, low-cost regional terminal. And that's certainly helping. And that's an artist impression of the same terminal. Uh, and here we have the new pier, which is going to be built for uh, Virgin Australia, and it'll also have an A380 gate, which Emirates will use from November this year. Um, so this, there are some good things happening from the infrastructure point of view. But as Troy Buswell eloquently said, as Troy does, he said it's all very well building, building these lovely terminals, but if you can't land aeroplanes, what's the use of them? Uh, and that's very, very well put. And that's another shot of the complex. This is the extension to the international terminal on the uh, eastern side where the new arrivals is going to be and that in fact opens in June this year. So there's going to be some relief for the long-suffering international passengers very, very shortly. With that, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my talk. Any questions? You speak of uh, the Perth Airport Corporation as being uh, uh, negative. Can't hear the question. You speak of, of Perth Airport Corporation as being very negative, but not sure they are. Yep. Um, can you tell me whether it's similar in the eastern states or uh, the Orange themselves here at um, Well, I'll, I'll uh, let um, two other people talk to that question. And that is why, first of all, Jeff Dixon, former CEO of Qantas, and he said, history now shows that privatisation of airports was a mistake. Uh, the other person, uh, and this was off the record, so uh, the private discussion with Anthony Albanese, who's actually a really good guy, he, did, he really gets transport. Uh, he said um, the, the, the privatisation of airports was not really robust enough um, and it should have had more checks and balances involved. I mean, one of the problems is we've privatised one of the most key parts of our infrastructure. Um, and the issue is Perth Airport is responsible to its shareholders. They're responsible to deliver profit to its shareholders. But the problem is, it's the key part of infrastructure for the state. And their, their real responsibility, in my view, in most of our views, is the responsibility to the state to be ahead of the curve, not always catching up. And the way they're structured now and what they're doing now and the negativity of some of the comments that are made uh, and certainly things are changing. They're certainly getting more, they're certainly coming around more aggressively to what they need to do. Um, but one gets the sense that they're really never going to get ahead, get ahead of the curve. Who's running the country? Good question. Good question. Sir. Uh, what's happened to the third, third runway? Yeah. Well, this is, the, this is what I've been talking about. The third runway, the whole situation is, and we're about to, we're about to talk to Troy about it next week, um, the airport... Troy Boswell went and saw the airport late last year and they gave him a sort of a timeline and said that by April this year, now, uh, they would have a commitment to go ahead. And they would tell the leaseholders of the land, uh, they've leased the land, um, to, 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 they've got a four year break clause on the lease, uh, and they would tell them to, uh, that they're going to break the lease, uh, giving them notice. However, I spoke to Alan Joyce from Qantas a couple of days ago in Dubai, and he said they've only had one meeting so far, nothing's been finalised, it really hasn't gone very far, and he's urging them to move ahead as fast as possible. So we're going to be developing the story next week with, in conjunction with Troy, uh, looking at the fact that Perth Airport has not kept to its, uh, its uh, timeline already, and we're only three months into it. Sir? 
getting back to this privatisation of the airports, which I've disagreed with from day one, it, it's put these people who have taken over the airports into a really good position to make money outside of the area of the actual aeroplanes. It's only got a little gigantic idea. Mm. Our government, less commissions, only got $7 million for this place. The people on the hill have now got a lease for, say, 45 years to go. Look what they're doing to the airport around here. They're accumulating, they've got land for nothing. Well, for such a long time, and Perth Airport's no different. Yes, there's several sites. I mean, one of the comments that have made to me is that the airports have found their way into the hands of land developers. And that's certainly, in some cases, that is the case. Uh, on the flip side of that also, uh, the airport, of course, is an incredibly important hub, uh, in piece of infrastructure. Therefore, at Perth Airport, having Woolworths and Coles out there is really important because so much of what they sell comes in by air, um, and so you've got to have certain, uh, it, it makes sense to have certain uh, in, um, uh, companies based around the airport from a simple point of, uh, it's, it's close to the, close to the uh, transportation hub. So there's two sides to it, uh, but certainly the airports have been criticised for spending too much time on the uh, non-aeronautical side of things, and uh, as somebody said, uh, the runways are an inconvenient truth. Um, so, uh, yes, it is a, it is a vexing problem, um, um, but, and certainly we need a more robust regime to ensure that we as a state get what we want. And I mean, and some, some people would argue that one of the things that should happen is the state government and the mining company should get together and fund this runway themselves and be done with it mm. and just build it. I mean, the cost, if the mining companies actually, actually sat down and said, how much will it cost us overall? How much is it costing us for delayed flights? How much is it going to cost us to upgrade all our airports to, to, to be able to compensate for the problems of Perth Airport? They may say it's infinitely cheaper with, with the government's help or government support or guarantees or whatever to build the runway ourselves. So, absolutely. absolutely. Well, yes, but there is, there is indeed a few more things here. Um, and there's an argument that you should really if you're building a runway, you might as well build it for an A330 or a, a 777, so you need more, more earthworks. And in this particular case, you need more taxiways as well. So there are additional costs. And we had an independent airport uh, consultant, uh, runway builder, give us a figure, and he said 200 million tops, no way. And one of the other interesting things, we had our first fog event for the season this morning uh, at Perth Airport, and we've been tackling Perth Air Airport about the fog situation. And we went to Air Services Australia and said, what will it cost to upgrade the ILS from Cat 1 to Cat 3B? And they said, 3 million tops. We went to an airport, independent airport consultant and said, what will it cost to put in a Cat 3B uh, uh, ILS on one runway? You only need it on one runway. Uh, and they said, 3 to $4 million tops. Perth Airport say it will cost them $36 million. <laughs> <laughs> and they talk about lighting, all sorts of stuff, and you sort of think there's something wrong. There is simply something wrong in the mathematics. So I don't know. No, so, Jeff, can can we ask you, in view of what you said about non-stops, to give us two minutes of your thoughts about the Dreamliner, please? Um, well, the Dreamliner. Uh, I mean, I could talk for days about the Dreamliner. Uh, it's an extraordinary aeroplane. It's had an extremely difficult birth, uh, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. Um, but now that they've got it right, uh, save the battery problem, uh, which they hopefully will have resolved very shortly, uh, it's going to be an outstanding aeroplane. And it will do things like fly Perth London non-stop um, and carry 250 passengers. It's a perfect size load, um, incredibly ec incredible economics, 25% less fuel burn. From a passenger point of view, it's the biggest step forward since the jumbo. From the point of view of your, your ride and your and pressurisation and the humidity and all those sort of factors, it's an outstanding aeroplane. Um, but it certainly had a very, very difficult birth. And, and interestingly enough, it's, it's cost Qantas dearly because they put all their eggs in the 787 basket because they didn't order triple sevens. Um, and right now Qantas should have in their fleet 55 triple seven, 55 787s. That many. And they are supposed to get one a month from August 2008. Um, so this has cost their pl fleet planning, their new routes, their whole strategy has been devastated by the late delivery.
Could there ever be a decision to look at another airport? Look, it's a very interesting question and a lot of folks that are affected by noise around Perth Airport bring that up. The reality is Perth Airport, and this, this, that's an interesting, very interesting question. Perth Airport from an infrastructure point of view, you've got all the infrastructures around it, industrial areas, the government's now committed to a road network around it, it's there forever. And because I mean the other thing is where do you put it? Where do you put it? Do you put it at Northern? The problem with Perth Airport is that so many people use it as a bus service. It's a fight it's fight fight. People live all around the airport. They want to fly to Newman or Paravadu and they don't want to drive to Northern. Well, <laughs> they don't want to drive down there either. Uh, but I think, I, think, I think one of the really important things with the noise debate, uh, particularly for Perth Airport, is for the noise debate to be had in an environment not of today, but of what aeroplane noise will be in 10 years' time when you would relocate an airport. You're going to have things like 787s. You're going to have continuous approach descent where you go from top of descent to the, to, to the runway without touching the throttles. You have uh, steeper glide slopes from 3% to 4% uh, glide slope uh, angle. And that, can, that, that alone, that one degree, one single degree of increase in the glide slope can cut the noise by 20%. So when you start adding all those cumulative things up like RNP, those you design the uh, pinpoint uh, flight paths, the noise footprint to Perth Airport will, will be reduced dramatically. So it has to stay where it is. And I think I'm getting a wind up too. <laughs> um, all I can say is, aren't we lucky to have been here today? Yes.